Welcome to Theonos. It's lovely to be back. Um, it's always an honor when Albert asked me to be part of the show and uh, to be part of the ministry that's happening, the amazing teachings that Albert is doing. I'm very honored to be part of this. So um, if you are watching this video, please hit the subscribe icon, hit the little bell icon so that you get notified and you don't miss out on anything that we're doing. And God is moving in this channel. We are so excited to see what God is doing and we really we feel like we're in the slipstream of God's Holy Spirit and that's very exciting now if you are a giver we just want to thank you and we want to make it available so if you want to give into the ministry the information is right on screen right now and uh, please feel free and we want to say thank you to our givers may God bless you we really appreciate that now Without any further ado, let's get going with what we're going to be speaking about today. And today is a topic that's very close to my heart. It's on the cutting edge of what God is, has been telling me over the past few weeks and um, even the past three, a few years. God has taken me through a process of learning about identity. And um, what I have been teaching about identity, I have come to know, to know as not necessarily 100% true. And, and we're speaking about identity we, we realize that in the Western world especially, we have a, a bad perception of what it is to be an individual and on what identity is. There's kind of a, a conflict between the two ideas of individualism and identity. But uh, we'll get through to that as soon as possible. Now, this book, I don't usually advertise books but this book is is part of what's leading me in a new pattern of thinking by dane ortland the book's called gentle and lowly and it speaks about the identity and the person of jesus and of god and the holy spirit i really recommend it. it's a brilliant read but starting off we're first going to speak about what jesus asked his disciples and and when we speak about identity we usually in the western world would start with who you really are or, or be who you want to be don't let anyone tell you who to be you should be authentic to yourself and although there's merit in that we do see the negative side of thinking that you are the captain of your ship you steer your life now i do i do really advocate that we shouldn't be passive we should be active in forging a way forward um, going through the tough times in life making decisions being active not passive when life happens to you you should happen to life i'm not speaking about that today what i am going to be speaking about is the fact that we think we are self-made men self-made women and that we make decisions for ourselves in john mark homer's new book practicing the way he speaks of a radical individualism as the myth of America. The, the, the United States of America is known for its radical individualism. And radical individualism is a myth. There is no such thing as a person who can be exactly there in uh, the proposed divine identity without the context of the church around them, without the context of the people around them. You are a follower. There is something you follow, even if it is an idea. If you subscribe to the idea of radical individualism, like, like uh, many of those um, social media influencers would say, you be you, you do you, honey. All of that is based on this, this lie, this myth of radical individualism and it's, it's ironic, UBU is a very original hashtag, but it's one of the most common hashtags in certain posts in America. In South Africa, we see the same problem. In, in most of the Western world, we are seeing this leaning towards a fake individualism that you get from other social media influencers. You do what they tell you to do, even if you do it in the name of individualism. You are following someone. You are following something. You're following an idea. Uh, an ideology you are becoming who you follow this is the truth of life who you follow has a bigger influence of who you become than your own thinking 
you might think, oh, I, this is my opinion, this is where I believe, this is what I think, but who you follow is actually where you're gonna end up. That's very important to, to, to understand. So maybe you think you're a very big individualist, you're a self-made man, but you are wearing the clothes that you see on TV, you are listening to a podcast by, let's say, Jordan Peterson or whatever, and you are becoming subscribed, you, you are, you are uh, conforming to the ideas that you are receiving, you are, you are conforming to the people that you watch the most. And um, I think this was true before the internet, before social media. People would have peop uh, authors that they followed. People would have um, leaders in the community that they followed. But today, in the age of social media, we are bombarded by things to follow. And not the least of these is just plain advertising. People look so happy in those advertisements where you have to buy I, I saw a picture the other day of a woman that was exceedingly happy and the ad is that if you buy this cell phone you will be that happy and that's the lie that 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 is the idea that we are falling into I had a conversation the other day that I could not believe where the person told me that if I do not buy his particular brand of cell phone, my life will continually be difficult and this cell phone is what I need to make my life better. And that's just not true. That is not true. But that is what the world has subscribed to, a materialistic view of what to follow, what to do, who am I becoming? And if I follow the world's way, I'm becoming a consumer. I'm becoming someone that just spends a lot of money. And it's funny that that is exactly what a lot of the advertising companies want you to believe because that makes them money. Now, I'm not against advertising. I'm not against these things. But what I just wanted to tell you is it's so easy to be led by something subconsciously that you can tell me this is my identity. This is who I am and still be just used as a product of advertising or not even advertising social media influences that need the likes they need the, the the views and you become the product of whatever they're trying to tell you and some of these people actually have very good motives they're, they're, they're not trying to mislead you they're not trying to do anything bad and i'm not against social media i'm just saying we are more exposed to following other people than ever before. So who are you following today? Who you follow determines where you end up. And I think that's a much bigger um, acid test of what identity is than what my personality test says about me. Now, all those things are important, but your main opinion about yourself doesn't count as much in your identity as who you are following so that's where it comes in that's where identity is so having laid that foundation let's get into what jesus asked his disciples all of that background and now we're starting with the conversation when jesus asked his disciples who do people say i am his disciples said some say you're a prophet some say you're elijah some say you're you're john the baptist and then they were speaking about what other people said about jesus and then jesus said but who do you say the Son of Man is? And we get a very interesting, that's a very interesting question. Jesus is asking, okay, what are other people saying about me? And then having heard their answers, he interrupts them and says, but who do you say I am? The, 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 the question is aimed at them personally. And God is asking the same question to us today. Who is God to you personally? Who's God to you personally? That is a question that we need to answer every day. A lot of us will answer, he's my savior, he's, he's, and, 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 and he's grace and he's love. God is great. God is kind. And all these things are true. But those are the answers that we learn from other people. Who is God to you by experience? How do you experience him? What is your direct opinion of his identity? And the reason this is so important 
is when Simon Peter answers, who, who am I to you? Simon Peter answers, and, and by, at that time he was still called Simon. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, and I say to you, you are Peter. And blessed are you, um, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Jesus answers Simon Peter by saying who Peter is to him, to Jesus. So here we see a thing that is all over scripture, that is true today. Your opinion of God, who God is to you personally, is directly linked to your identity. A.W. Tozer said it like this, what comes into mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Wow, that's a, that's a quote. I underlined that 10 times when I read that. What comes into mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. So when Peter says, Jesus, to me, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus says twice, you are. He says, you are blessed. And he says, and I say to you, you are Peter, which means rock. His identity shift came in when he knew who God was to him. So if you want to know who you are, really, not who you think you are, not how your parents raised you, not what friends made you out to be, which is, that's who we are for the most, for the most part because that's who we follow, who we used to follow as kids. But now, as followers of Christ, there should only be one person giving us identity. And our opinion of our leader, our Messiah, our Jesus determines our identity. If you have a limited idea of who Jesus is, you will have a limited idea of who you are. There is a beautiful passage in scripture. I don't know why we translate it like this, but in English, um, especially in the old English, we would translate it as you are the apple of God's eye. Beautiful image. I don't know where the word apple comes in. The Hebrew literally means you are the diminutive little man in God's pupil. So I'm not going to do this with a camera that will be way too intimate. But when you are really close to someone, intimate face to face like this, and they look into your eyes, they can see the reflection of themselves in your pupil. And obviously you can see yourself in their pupil. Now, that little man, that is what the Bible says. You are, you personally, you are the little man in God's eye. In other words, God is so close to you at all times, number one. But number two, you can only ever see your true reflection when you're staring in God's eyes. Every other view you have of yourself is clouded by human frailty, clouded by human um, vagueness, brokenness. You are wearing the lens of all your um, psychological complexes when you look in the mirror. You are seeing someone that is different. You are seeing a failure. You're seeing maybe an arrogance. You're seeing this great and mighty man that doesn't need anyone or anything. But when you look in the eyes of God, you're seeing yourself for who you really are. And usually, that changes everything. But you can only do that in the deepest intimacy that you have with God. You cannot know who you are unless you get it from the one who made you. This is a, a fact of life. The only one that knows who you really are is the one who made you. Because he made you on purpose. He made you by purpose. He made you for a purpose. Now, having said that, let's ask that question again. Who is Jesus to you? I'm not asking you what your church taught you about Jesus. I'm not asking you what culture or social media has taught you about Jesus. Who is Jesus to you personally? That answer will break the door open to knowing who you really are. You might think you're a coward. You might think 
you, you, you're, you're sinful, you might think you're this, you might think you're that, but that's not how God sees you. Every insecurity you have is directly related to how you see God. And it should be good news. Insecurities, all those things that we worry about are not permanent. They can be healed. And this is how we heal them, by staring in the face of Jesus Christ. By looking Him in the eye, by being so close to Him at all times, by abiding in Christ, we become who we really are. Now, let's ask that question. Who is Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Most of the time when we ask that question, we get answers like, He's the Savior. He's the one that freed me. He's the one that healed me. All of that's true. All of that's good. But that's not who He is. That's what He does. And um, if you read in the Bible, you'll see that the heart, the, the, the heart of someone is who they really are. And it reveals the heart. It's still, a, it's still a, a, an idiom in, in English today where we say, but his heart is somewhere else. He's, he's physically he's here, but his heart's somewhere else. It's, we're talking about his heart is, is the guiding principle of his life. In Hebrew, the word heart, uh, levab or lev, just it, it means the mind, will, emotions, yes, but it also means appetites and motivations. We see that that they that that in the Bible sometimes it says we have a big heart for food. Is that, that that's the appetite? That is the things that guide you, the things that make you do what you do. Um, Dane Ortland speaks about it as the heart is the reason you get out of bed in the morning and the last thing you think about before you fall asleep at night. That's your heart. That's the thing that when someone cuts you, you bleed that. And in the Bible, in the Gospels especially, there are only three verses tied together in which Jesus tells you, this is how my heart looks. In fact, um, there's only one verse in those three verses where he directly says, my heart is... And in that is the whole secret. It's not the secret. It's, it's the whole person. It's the whole, the reason Jesus does what he does. It's the reason Jesus came to earth. It's the most defining aspect of Jesus is the following. Let me read it for us. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus could have said, I am glorious in heart. I am forgiving in heart. And he, will, he, he is all of those things. He could have chosen anyone of thousands of things to describe what his heart looks like. But the one thing he chose, the one thing that Jesus Christ defines himself as, is gentle and lowly. Now that word gentle and lowly, for that matter, gets translated most of the time with the word humble. Now humble... Um, has two meanings in the New Testament. One of the, the meanings of humble is the ones that, the, the way we use it today, he's gentle, he's not um, going to go over the top, he's uh, modest. And the other word for humble, the other translation for humble was to be lowly, to be someone that poor people associated with. And that's what Jesus said. And uh, we're very excited that that's how he wants to be known. When you cut Jesus, what comes out? Gentleness, lowliness. Jesus is not trigger happy. Jesus doesn't run around making assumptions of, your, of who you think you are. He doesn't make assumptions based on your mistakes. He doesn't run around judging people for the slightest sin. His first reaction is gentleness. And that is to be accepted, to be loved. Now we think maybe that's who Jesus is, but that's not who God is in the Old Testament. God was a very judgy God. That's not true. 
We read in the book of Exodus where Moses comes before God while he's on Mount Sinai. And he says, God, I, I want to know you. I want you to introduce yourself to me. I want to experience you. And in the conversation, God comes, stands beside Moses and he says, I will introduce myself. And he says, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. And, and actually, he says, I am Yahweh. I am Yahweh. I am f rich in unfailing love, abounding in mercy, slow to anger. That introduction is not the only time God introduces himself like that with those exact words. He says it nine times in the Old Testament. When God says who he is, it's slow to anger, rich in unfailing love. Like I said, it, it, it is full of grace and mercy. Nine times. He says it to Moses. He says it three times in the book of Psalms. And he also says it in uh, Joel, in the book of Jonah. In the book of Jonah, this is especially prevalent because Jonah was mad at God for not bringing wrath on the people of the city of Nineveh. And he was angry because he believed that they deserved it. And God said, you don't know who I am. Let me introduce myself to you. I am rich in unfailing love, abounding in grace and mercy. I'm slow to anger. This is who God really is. Judgment is what he does, but it's not who he is. Who he is, the most important thing about God, is his loving kindness. That is his identity. That is why he is here. The Hebrew term slow to anger means he has a long, it literally means it's an idiom. He has a long nose. He's long nosed. Now, I don't know if you can tell on camera. I'm going to turn to the side. But I look like God in that aspect. But it's an idiom in Hebrew to say that he's slow to anger. It means it takes a long time for him to turn up his nose at you. It, um, anger in Hebrew was um, always um, in, in language uh, coupled with the uh, idea of flaring your nostrils. When you're angry, your nostrils kind of, I can't really do it, is it? I don't know. There's something that happens with your nose. I'm rarely angry, but my nose is very active anyway. But the idea is God is slow to anger. He will never turn up his nose at you. Abounding in, in grace and mercy. The Hebrew word grace, gen, it means to be beautiful. So if it's, 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 it's a, act, a passive. So when, when uh, Ruth um, says, may I find favor in your sight, it's usually, it's gen, and and it means, may I be beautiful in your sight. Now we translate it as beautiful as well, but it's not only beautiful, it means favor, it means that when you look at me, you find me pleasing. If you have grace on me, in the Hebrew sense, it means when you think or look at me, you find me pleasing. And it says more about the person having grace than, a, than the person receiving grace. So when we say, when God looks at you, He loves you, it's not, it's not saying anything about you, it's saying everything about Him. Same word with Mercy, racham. Racham is usually the word when a mother picks up a baby and holds her close. The, the, the mother holds the baby close. And she looks deep into her eyes and kind of hugs it and um, uh, pats it on the back, putting it to sleep. That's the Hebrew word for mercy. So God's thoughts toward you, grace and mercy, are completely who He is. You cannot take grace away from God. It is part of his identity. And then rich in unfailing love. Hebrew word for unfailing love is chesed. It is my favorite word in the Bible. And it means 
loving kindness, grace, mercy, faithfulness, loyalty. It literally, the, the original word meant loyalty to the covenant he made. Truth. So it's, it's his inability to lie to you. David says when God thinks about him, he thinks about, when, when, when God thinks about David, God sees David through the lens of his loyalty to David, not through the lens of David's disloyalty to him. So if you want to know who you are, you first need to start, who is God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who are they? And in your intimacy with them, in your abiding in Christ, you will start seeing them for who they really are. And then the scales will fall off your eyes and you will start seeing who you really are. Someone said the real you comes out when you're under pressure. I do not believe that. I believe the real you is who you are when you're completely in self-abandonment in the presence of God. When you're deep in worship, that's who you really are. So I pray that God blesses you. You have a great week. And if you want to know who you are, spend some time with Jesus today. God bless you. Amen.